In this lecture, we're going to look at the spinal cord and spinal nerves. The spinal cord is going to extend from the foramen magnum down to the second or third lumbar vertebrae. Now, it's going to be segmented just like uh, the vertebrae. We had the different uh, sections of the vertebrae, the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. It's going to be no different with the spinal cord. We're going to have a cervical segment, a thoracic segment, a lumbar segment, and a sacral segment. And it's going to give rise to 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Now, the spinal cord is not uniform in diameter throughout its length. In fact, we're going to see these enlargements here, such as the cervical enlargement right here. Um, the spinal cord is going to narrow out as we go down through the thoracics. And then it's going to enlarge once again in the lumbar region. Um, some other um, parts that we want to note are the spinal cord ends at what's called the conus medullaris. Okay, which is at about L1, L2. Um, and then these nerves here that are coming off, these are spinal nerves. If you notice, it makes almost what looks like a horse's tail. And that's what this is called right here. Cauda equina actually means horse's tail. Caudal is tail. Equine is horse. Horse's tail. And then um, we're going to learn about the coverings of the spinal cord. And some of those coverings um, come down and they form one line, which you're never really going to see. It's the phylum terminale. But what that does is it kind of anchors the, the spinal cord down. Okay, I mentioned the coverings around the spinal cord. Those are the meninges. And it's connective tissue membrane that surrounds the spinal cord and brain. And going from the outside in, you have the dura mater. Dura means, well, durable. Uh, or strong or tough. Mater actually means mother, like your alma mater is your mother's school. Um, so actually the literal translation of dura mater is tough mother. And it is. It's very strong. It's very tough. It's hard to cut through. If you're working on a cadaver, you're going to have to have a nice fresh scalpel blade. Or what I like to do is... Um, pinch it with some forceps and nip it with some scissors and then cut it with uh, with scissors uh, because it is so tough. The next layer is going to be the arachnoid mater and uh, it's called arachnoid mater because close up it's kind of spider webby. And then um, underneath that, which clings very tight to the spinal cord, is going to be the pia mater. It's going to give it almost a fuzzy look when you're looking at a specimen. Now these are the same coverings that are going to cover the brain. And when we get to the brain, I'll give you a little mnemonic to help you memorize these in order. Now the spaces in between, we have epidural. Epi means above. So this is going to be above the dura. So it's going to be out here. And oftentimes anesthesia is injected in the epidural space. And that's basically if you don't have to go in very far with a needle uh, to inject. And it's just going to be absorbed uh, into the area uh, that's needed, you know, for, for that uh, anesthetic effect. Then we have the subdural space. So subdural is just underneath the dura and uh, it's going to be in between the arachnoid and the dura. And uh, we're going to find serous fluid there. And then we have the subarachnoid space. So the subarachnoid space is going to be between the arachnoid and the pia mater. And here we're going to find cerebral spinal fluid, uh, which is going to be circulating through that space. Here's a cross-section of the spinal cord, and notice that it looks 
kind of like a, like a Honda symbol, doesn't it? Uh, unless you're in kind of a nasty accident, then it might look like Hyundai. But uh, we have this H shape. And again, it's going to look a little bit different depending on what level of the spinal cord uh, we cut through and look at. So some parts, we have white matter. And we're going to have the H here is going to be gray matter. So white matter on the outside, gray matter on the inside. And that's going to be opposite of what we find in the brain. The brain is going to have gray matter on the outside and white matter on the inside. So let's look at the white matter. We're going to have these, these columns here. And here is the dorsal or posterior column. We have the ventral or anterior column. And then over here we have the lateral columns. Some other structures you need to know. We have the posterior median sulcus. And here we have the anterior median fissure. So if we need to know anterior from posterior, the best thing to do is, if we look down here, we see this big gap. The big gap is a fissure. Now we know that there's an anterior median fissure, so this must be the anterior portion of the spinal cord. Back here is the posterior portion of the spinal cord. Now looking at the gray matter, the H here, we're going to have a posterior horn. We're going to have a lateral horn. And we're going to have an anterior horn. And the spinal cord is not solid. There is a canal going right through the middle of the gray matter. That's the central canal. And cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow through that as well. Now coming off of the spinal cord, or, or I should say going into the spinal cord and coming off of it, going into the spinal cord, we're going to have these, these little dorsal rootlets. Then we have a dorsal root, and this is a dorsal root ganglion. And here we have a spinal nerve. Now, what is going to go through the dorsal root ganglion, and the dorsal root, and the dorsal rootlets are going to be sensory information coming from the body, going through these dorsal roots into the posterior portion of the spinal cord to go up tracts to go to the brain. Okay. Now, the spinal nerve is what we would call a mixed spinal nerve because it has sensory information going through it, but it also has um, motor information going through there. So what's coming down from the brain is going to go through these anterior rootlets here, or ventral, uh, ventral rootlets, and ventral anterior on a human are the same. Um, we have uh, the ventral root, and these are going to convey motor signals, okay? Motor information. So, posterior, sensory, anterior, motor. And again, we're going to have the um, spinal nerve, which is mixed sensory and motor. Going back to this dorsal root ganglion, what is a ganglion? In the peripheral nervous system, which these are part of the peripheral nervous system, spinal cord is central nervous system, but anything coming off of the brain or spinal cord, if you remember, it's going to be part of the peripheral nervous system. So a ganglion uh, contains nerve cell bodies. So in this dorsal root ganglion, that's what you're going to find is nerve cell bodies. Okay. Now let's just suppose we accidentally cut this dorsal root. Now let's just pretend this is the nerve that goes to your arm. In reality, there's multiple nerves and everything, but just for simplicity, let's just say this is the nerve that controls your arm. If we cut this dorsal root, are we going to move 
be able to move our arm. Well, what is the function of the dorsal rut? It's sensory, right? So, yes, we'll be able to move our arm. But will we be able to feel anything in that arm? And the answer would be no, because, again, that's sensory. Okay, let's pretend like this is fine. The ventral root, we cut that. Are we going to be able to move our arm? Okay, what's the function of the ventral root? Again, that's going to um, contain motor fibers going to the muscles. So, no, we wouldn't be able to move the arm. Would we feel anything? Well, the dorsal root is intact, so yes, we'd still be able to feel it. We just couldn't move it. Okay, so the spinal nerve, if we cut that, are we going to be able to move the arm? Mm, the answer is no. Would we feel anything to the arm? Again, the answer is no. So you wouldn't be able to move or feel the arm because we're cutting both sensory and motor fibers. Okay. So again, just in recap, the cross-section of the spinal cord, we have the white matter. And what I did mention is white matter is going to contain myelinated axons. Gray matter is going to contain unmyelinated axons and cell bodies, neuron cell bodies. Okay, so the white matter is myelinated axons forming nerve tracts. We have the fissure. Remember the fissure? Where is that? Anterior or posterior? It's going to be anterior. Let's go back. Anterior, median, fissure. And then we have the sulcus. Where's the sulcus? It's posterior. So the posterior, median, sulcus. Anterior, median, fissure. And then we have three columns, or another name for the columns are funiculi. We have the ventral column. And again, ventral is in the front, so here's the ventral column. We have the dorsal column. Here's the dorsal column. And we have the lateral column. And of course, here's the lateral column. In the gray matter, again, gray is going to be unmyelinated axons and neuron cell bodies. Um, so the gray matter, again, like it says here, neuron cell bodies, dendrites, axons. The horns are going to be the posterior or dorsal. So here's the posterior or dorsal horn. The anterior or ventral horn. Whoops, went the wrong way. So here's the anterior or ventral horn. And then here's the lateral horn. Lateral horn. And then we have these areas called commissures. Commissures are where fibers can cross over from one side to the other. We have the gray commissure, and that is right here, and that contains the central canal. And again, fibers can cross over through these commissures. And then we have the white commissure. And you can see that right here. So let's talk about a reflex arc. This is the basic functional unit of the nervous system and the simplest portion ca capable of receiving stimulus and producing a response. It's actually kind of a no-brainer, and, and that's true. If you've ever done these experiments, which personally I'm not too crazy about, but uh, I have seen these experiments where you take a frog, the frog's spinal cord is severed, which means no information is going to or from the brain, and you can apply a stimulus and you will get movement um, 
because again the brain does not have to be involved in a reflex arc. So the components of this, we're going to have to have a sensory receptor of some kind. Let's say we have a pain receptor. Okay, so there would be an example of a sensory receptor, pain receptor. Then we're going to have to have a sensory neuron. Again, that sensory neuron is going to come from the sensory receptor. It's going to go through the, the mixed spinal nerve. Then it'll branch off and go posterior. So it's going to go through the dorsal root into the spinal cord. Now, because it does not have to go to the brain, it's going to make a U-turn, and it does this via the interneuron. Okay, so the interneuron is going to connect the uh, sensory neuron to the motor neuron. The motor neuron is going to go through the ventral root, down through the mixed spinal nerve, and it's going to go to the effector organ. In this case, the effector organ is going to be the muscle. So let's suppose, you know, uh, you stuck yourself with a pin. That information is going to go, again, through the mixed spinal nerve, uh, through the dorsal root, into the posterior part of the spinal cord, through the inner neuron, through the ventral root, um, down a motor neuron, to the muscle, and you're going to pull away immediately. You're not going to have to stick that needle in um, and your brain is going to have to say you know I think that hurts maybe we should pull our finger away no we don't have time for that now of course this information does go up to the brain but it takes a little bit for the brain to realize kind of what's happened have you ever done that where you've stepped on something or touched something hot you pull back immediately and then you start feeling the pain and realize what's happened well, that's what the reflex arc is there for. It's to happen immediately before the brain has time to analyze anything to prevent further injury. Now we have stretch reflexes when muscles contract in response to a stretch force that's applied to them. Now in the muscles, we have these things called muscle spindle fibers. There's going to be gamma motor neurons, sensory neurons, and more gamma motor neurons and, and basically what this muscle spindle fiber does is it kind of sets the length of the muscle and it helps monitor that length so if the muscle gets overstretched it will contract the muscle down and then relax it back to where it needs to be so it's always monitoring to make sure that that muscle does not get overstretched in the tendons, we also have uh, some receptors here. We have what's called the Golgi tendon organ. It prevents contracting muscles from applying excessive tension to the tendon. So muscle contraction increases tension applied to the tendons. In response, action potentials are conducted to the spinal cord. And one way we test this is by tapping on it with a, a diagnostic hammer. And uh, let's suppose, now here it's showing a hamstring, but let's suppose it's your patellar tendon in the front here. We tap that tendon with the patellar hammer. We put a quick stretch in that tendon. The tendon, uh, or the Golgi tendon organ, I should say, thinks that that tendon is being overstretched. And that is what's going to tell the muscles to contract. And that's why you wind up kicking outward. Okay, so again, it's just a, a mechanism to keep the tendon from being overstretched. Then we have the withdrawal reflex. Its function is to remove a body limb or other part from a painful stimulus. So for instance, if you're walking along and step on a giant cartoon tack Okay, we're going to have sensory information, again, going up through the sensory neuron to the posterior part of the spinal cord through those um, uh, dorsal roots. It's going to go through an excitatory interneuron, 
and then down an alpha motor neuron, in this case, um, to the uh, hamstrings, and it's going to cause it to contract so that you bend your knee and pull it away from that uh, tack. But here's the thing. If you're going to be able to contract your hamstrings, then you're going to have to do what to your quads? You're going to have to be able to relax them. So they need to relax so that the hamstrings can contract and actually bend the knee. If both are contracting at the same time, then your leg just stiffens out. So this causes relaxation of the extensor muscles when the flexor muscles contract. So once again, we're going to have sensory information going to the um, spinal cord. We're going to have an excitatory interneuron and the alpha motor neuron going to the hamstrings. But we're also going to have signals going to the inhibitory neuron and um, we're going to inhibit contraction of the quads, relaxing them so that the knee can bend. And like I said too, that information is going to go up to the brain so you do know that it hurts because that's where you feel things, is in your brain. The brain itself doesn't feel anything. When they do surgery, I'm going off on a little tangent here, but when we do surgery on the brain, you can poke at the brain and everything else, it feels nothing. But all the aches and pains and everything that you feel are actually in your brain because that's where the interpretation takes place. So what happens if you step on that cartoon tack and you bend your one leg? Are you just going to collapse into a little heap? Well, hopefully not. And so that's the job of the withdrawal reflex with the crossed extensor reflex. So with the withdrawal reflex uh, is initiated in one lower limb, the crossed extensor reflex causes extension of the opposite lower limb. Okay. So here's alpha motor neurons going to the quads of the opposite limb so that the leg straightens out and keeps you from falling over when this limb um, bends away. Okay. So let's suppose you were taking a step, getting ready to straighten that leg out, step down on that tack at the same time you were getting ready to bend this leg well again this keeps you from falling so this leg will straighten out this one will bend and pull away from the stimulus looking at peripheral nerves again a nerve is a collection of axons okay it's axon bundles so if we look at the arrangement of a nerve we have the axon bundles, and if you remember back in muscles, remember a bundle of muscle cells was called a fascicle? Well, this is also a fascicle. Okay, We're going to have Schwann cells surrounding the axons, so this is creating our myelin sheath. And then the connective tissues that are going to surround the nerve is going to be, again, similar to the muscle. Remember with the muscle, we had a uh, epimecium, a perimecium, and an endomecium? Well, this is no different. On the outside, and again, think of what's on the outside of your skin, it's or what's above the dermis, right? The epidermis. So what's on the outside or above the nerve here? Uh, we have the epineurium. So that surrounds the nerve. What surrounds the fascicles, remember in the muscle, again it was the perimecium, in this case it's the perineurium. And then what's going to surround the axons and also the Schwann cells is the endoneurium. Okay, so again we have epineurium, perineurium, and endoneurium. You might notice too that this nerve has blood vessels going through it. 
Okay. You ever lay on your arm and, uh, you know, you, you wake up and you can't move that arm and it's all numb and everything and you're over there shaking it and you start to do CPR on your hand trying to revive it and you think, oh, geez, this time it's for real. Okay. And then all of a sudden you start to feel those pins and needles again. You start to be able to move that arm again and get feeling back into it. What causes that? And I bet you said uh, lack of circulation. Actually, that's not what's causing the arm. Well, we'll get to that. But that's not really what's causing the arm to um, not be able to move. Um, and not really what's causing the tingling and all of that or the numbness. You're compressing a nerve. That's what's keeping, uh, that's what makes your arm fall asleep. That's what keeps you from feeling um, or being able to move it. So you're compressing a nerve. Now, yeah, you're partially right because again, nerves do have um, arteries and veins within them. So you're also compressing that as well. But uh, really, when you know your arm or leg falls asleep, that's because of nerve compression. You take the compression off of the nerve, it begins to function again normally, and you feel those pins and needles which we call paresthesia. Okay, looking at spinal nerves, we're going to have these groups of spinal nerves called plexuses. So we have a cervical plexus. And a plexus is basically where the nerves join and split apart and join again and, and split apart again. Um, and, and we can have blood vessels do that too. We can have a venous plexus. Again, it forms almost a mesh or network of blood vessels. In this case, it forms kind of a mesh or network of uh, nerves. So the cervical plexus is going to go from C1 to C4. We have a brachial plexus that goes from C5 to T1. Brachial refers to what? your arm. So these are basically uh, nerves that are going to innervate the arm. Then we get down a little bit farther. We have the lumbar plexus from L1 to L4. We have the sacral plexus from L4 to S4. And sometimes we just group those together as the lumbosacral plexus from L1 to S4. And then we have the coccygeal plexus that goes from S4 to CO, the coccygeal nerve. Okay. And uh, the way we number these nerves, it's just like the way we numbered uh, the vertebrae. Remember I said with the vertebrae, you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we have seven cervical vertebrae, uh, lunch, let's see, 12. We have 12 thoracic vertebrae. Dinner, hopefully you get to dinner by five. So we have five lumbar vertebrae. And as you can see here in the cervicals, we have C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, and wait a second, C8. I thought there was only seven cervical vertebrae. Why is it saying C8 right here? Well, it's not a misprint. There are eight cervical nerves. There are seven cervical vertebrae, but there's eight cervical nerves. We get that extra one because we have the nerve that's coming out but above the atlas and um, below the occipital bone. Okay, so we have that one uh, coming up between the skull and the first vertebrae. So that gives us one extra. So there are um, eight cervical spinal nerves. Now, once we get past that, we're back to our normal counting. T1 all the way through T12, L1 through L5. And then we have our sacrals, um, S1 through S5, and then our coccygeal nerve. And we can see over here, functions, the cervical nerves, 
uh, we have head movement of these nerves, diaphragm movement, which we'll talk about soon. Um, that's in this area. Uh, neck and shoulder movements are in this area. Upper limb movements are in this area. It's kind of crossing over here from the cervicals and thoracics. Um, we have thoracic rib movements for breathing, which is going to take up the thoracics here. Also tone and postural back muscles uh, for movement of the vertebral column. Here we have hip movements in this region and lower limb movements in this region. So if there's damage to the spinal cord, you can get a good idea of um, what's going to be affected depending on what level of the spinal cord is affected and what those nerves are actually innervating. Okay, so this guy is a little creepy, but uh, bear with me here. Uh, this is what we call a dermatomal map, and this is the skin area supplied with sensory innervation by spinal nerves. And what we're saying here is that um, we, we, if we see numbness or tingling in these areas, that would be a dermatomal pattern. So, for instance, um, we would know then that the lesion is in the spinal nerve as it's coming out of the intervertebral foramen. Okay, so back here is the lesion. Either some damage to the nerve or a herniation of a disc is compressing that nerve root, and this is the pattern it's going to cause. So if we see numbness or tingling in these areas, in these specific patterns, we know where to trace the lesion back to. For instance, if I see, you know, a patient comes to me, has numbness, tingling, weakness in this L4 uh, region, okay, or even pain in this L4 region, then I can trace it back to this L4 nerve root, okay? Or if they're having pain, numbness, or tingling in the L5 dermatome. Again, I can, let's see, a little hard to see here, but the L5 dermatome, I can go back and um, probably find the lesion at the L5 vertebrae. Okay, so does that make sense? Now, if we have, uh, let's see, I'm going to switch this to my highlighter. Now, if we have a lesion in a different region here, like let's suppose there's numbness and maybe tingling in this area here. And let me just go ahead and trace that. Okay, let's suppose that there's uh, numbness or tingling there. Is this a dermatomal pattern? And the answer would be no, it's actually crossing over dermatomes. So it's going a little through L1, it's going through a little bit of L2, yeah, possibly some of L3. Now, this is not a lesion way back here at the spinal cord. This is a lesion of a single nerve. In this case, it would be the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is a nerve that comes out. Remember your anterior superior iliac spines on your hip bone? That's the region where that um, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve comes out of. And so if you're wearing maybe really tight pants that are pressing on that, or maybe you have a job where you're leaning up against a table, maybe on an assembly line sorting things or assembling things, and you're compressing that, it's possible to get this numbness or tingling. This is called moralgia parenthetica. Okay, so this is different. This is a cutaneous nerve, um, a single nerve that is compressed or damaged. The rest of these are going to be lesions at the spinal cord. Okay, so that's what a dermatomal map is.
Let's look at a cervical plexus. Uh, cervical plexus goes from C1 to C4. The main nerve I want you to remember here is the phrenic nerve. So from C3 through C5, uh, cervical and uh, brachial plexus, and it's going to innervate the diaphragm. The way you're going to remember this is C3, 4, 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. Okay, and you have one running down each side, and it's going to innervate each half of the diaphragm, which means if you have damage to one of the phrenic nerves, well, what do you think is going to happen? If we damage one of the phrenic nerves, are you going to get no movement of the diaphragm? Are you going to get movement from half of the diaphragm? Or is the entire diaphragm going to move just fine? What do you think? Well, if you cut one of the phrenic nerves, then only half of the diaphragm is actually going to work. We call that a hemidiaphragm. Okay. So again, C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. Now the brachial plexus, um, the major nerves that come from that, and, and it's going to come from C5 through T1, the major nerves are the axillary nerve, the radial nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, the ulnar nerve, and the median nerve. And the brachial plexus is divided into roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. So roots, trunks, division, cords, and branches. How in the world are you going to remember all of that? Well, here's a mnemonic for you. Randy Travis drinks cold beer. Okay, you can come up with your own mnemonic if you'd like. But Randy Travis drinks cold beer. Now, I want to focus a little bit on the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. The median nerve is what's involved when you have carpal tunnel syndrome. And that goes through the, um, the carpal tunnel. Okay. And it's going to innervate your thumb, first finger, middle finger, and the lateral side of your ring finger. So that's where you're going to get pain, numbness, tingling. It also innervates your thinner eminence, those muscles. And so you can have atrophy there. Sometimes, though, people will also get numbness and tingling in their little finger and the medial side of their ring finger um, because if you're doing some repetitive motion such as typing what else are you probably doing using a mouse right and a lot of people will rest their pisiform remember the pisiform they'll rest that on the table while they're using the mouse and they're compressing that little tunnel that's formed between the pisiform and the hook of the hamate remember that tunnel is called the tunnel of Guillaume well, that's where a branch of the ulnar nerve goes. And that's going to innervate the little finger and the medial um, section of the ring finger. And here we see the axillary nerve. And the axillary nerve is a branch off the posterior cord. And you can see that it innervates teres minor and the deltoid muscle. And then here's the cutaneous distribution of the axillary nerve. Here we see the radial nerve. Uh, the radial nerve also coming off of the posterior cord. And it's going to innervate um, quite a few of the extensor muscles. And you can just go ahead and take a look at those individual muscles. And this is what the cutaneous presentation would be like. So you might have pain, numbness, tingling, or what have you within uh, these regions. See how these differ, though, from a dermatome.
This is the musculocutaneous nerve. That's a branch off the lateral cord. Innervates the biceps brachii, the brachialis, and the coracobrachialis. This would be the cutaneous distribution. The ulnar nerve, I mentioned this before, um, but the ulnar nerve is coming off the medial cord. Um, it goes behind the elbow, on the medial side of the elbow. This is why when you whack your elbow, you get that like electric shock kind of feel down into your little finger. Okay, that's because, you know, we talk about the funny bone funny bone is really not a bone at all it's the ulnar nerve going through that groove in the humerus and then on down and it's going to innervate little finger the um let's see that would be the medial side of the ring finger and also the hypothenar eminence and as I said, a branch of that is going to go through the tunnel of Guillaume and, um, again, innervate these areas. And you can take a look at what muscles that they're going to innervate. The median nerve, again, big one for the carpal tunnel syndrome um, because of this median nerve. And you can see that it's a branch of a combination of the medial and latter lateral cord and it's going to come down it's going to go underneath also the pronator teres so if the pronator teres is tight it can compress that nerve and you'll get carpal tunnel like symptoms even though it may not be uh, a problem with the carpal tunnel the fact that the pronator teres, which goes over the top of it, is compressing it, you'll still get the, that feeling. And again, here's the cutaneous distribution with the thumb, first finger, middle finger, and the lateral side of the ring finger. Again, you could take a look at uh, other muscles that it's going to uh, innervate. Here's the lumbosacral plexus, and I guess the big nerve that I want you to take a look at here is going to be the sciatic nerve. Okay, that's the biggie for, um, for my class. If you're in another class, you may need to concentrate on others as well. But we have the iliohypogastric, the ilioinguinal, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. I talked about that earlier the genito uh, femoral nerve, the um, femoral nerve, the obturator nerve, lumbosacral trunk, superior gluteal, inferior gluteal, and the sciatic is made up with the common fibular or peroneal and the tibial nerve. So another name for sciatic nerve is the ischiatic nerve. Then we have a posterior femoral cutaneous and the pedundal nerve. Again, we're not going to go into details right now on what all of those nerves do, but the sciatic nerve, a lot of people will have problems with sciatica, which is pain running down the back of the leg. And uh, that sciatic nerve, when we look at it in a cadaver dissection, it's a very large nerve. It's about as thick as your finger or thumb. Here's the obturator nerve. It's going to be branches of L2, 3, and 4. And you can see that's going to innervate uh, the adductors, basically. And here's the cutaneous distribution. Here's the femoral nerve. Again, branches of L2, 3, and 4. And you can see the muscles that it innervates, and here's its cutaneous distribution. And again, this distribution is different than a dermatome. 
you'll have a, a much smaller presentation with a dermatome than you will, will with um, a nerve compression. Here's the tibial nerve. That's coming from L4, 5, S1, S2, and S3 combinations. You can see which muscles are affected or innervated uh, by that. That would be affected if that nerve gets damaged. And here's the cutaneous distribution. Fibular or peroneal nerve branches from uh, L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3 coming together. These are going to be um, some of the lateral and anterior muscles, except for the bicep femoris, uh, short head. That's a posterior muscle, but mostly anterior muscles. But you can see it does wrap around uh, in the cutaneous presentation. And looking at peripheral nervous system disorders, general disorder, we have anesthesia that's loss of sensation. Hyperesthesia, that's increased sensitivity to pain, pressure, light. If you've ever eaten something very spicy and then maybe you grab some hot coffee or hot tea and go to take a drink, your tongue basically is on fire. Okay, that would be hyperesthesia. It's a lot more sensitive than if you just drink that hot beverage before eating something spicy. Some medications will cause light sensitivity, and we would say that would be a hyperesthesia. So an increased sensitivity to pain, pressure, or light. Paresthesia is that tingling, prickly, burning, ants crawling feeling that you would get. Again, that's kind of how it feels when your limb is, um, has fallen asleep and it's waking back up again. Kind of that tingly feeling. That's paresthesia. Neuralgia is basically nerve pain. Okay, so it's, and that's caused by nerve inflammation. And it can cause a stabbing pain. It can cause almost kind of an electric shock type pain. Um, sciatica, again, is pain radiating down the back of the thigh and leg. Um, and again, that's originating from the sciatic nerve. Infections, um, you can have a herpes infection, which is a skin lesion where that virus is lying dormant. Uh, within that nerve, if it becomes reactivated again, that's when that lesion can appear. Shingles or herpes zosters is adult disease of chicken pox. Okay, and again, if you've had chicken pox, you have this virus lying dormant within your nerves. And if your immune system gets lowered, um, or this can happen with age or illness or what have you, um, then that virus can reactivate and uh, you'll get a outbreak of shingles. One thing to note too, if you're taking care of a patient with shingles, that those little vesicles, those little blisters that form have active virus in them. So take precautions. Even if you've had chicken pox or you've had vaccinations, it's not common, but it does happen where someone can redevelop chicken pox again. And then we have poliomyelitis. Um, this is infantile paralysis. When I was growing up, that was a big deal. Usually affected younger children, and it would uh, paralyze, well, just about anything that it affected. Um, I've known people that have had paralyzed arms, paralyzed legs, um, but if it paralyzed the diaphragm, uh, basically affecting the, the phrenic nerves, then these uh, kids could not breathe on their own and they had to be put into something called an iron lung. And I'll pull up a picture of an iron lung. And this is what they stayed in all of their life. Nowadays we have other things that we can use, uh, ventilators and, and what have you. But at that time, that was the only option. And you would have wards just filled 
with these uh, iron lungs. There were always uh, drives going on to try to um, raise money um, to buy these iron lungs. And then we also have genetic and autoimmune disorders such as myasthenia gravis, which results in fatigue and muscular weakness due to inadequate acetylcholine receptors. 